Or if you came here and don't have a Bible, I'd love to have you follow along. You'll see we're on page 1156 in one of the Bibles underneath the seats. Good to see you all. Uh, this is last service. This is our thinnest service today and uh, as far as people. And, well, I'm thinner than when I first started this morning, too. I haven't eaten yet, so... But one thing I noticed that I really like about the fact is that none of you are in your pajamas. <laughs> you all got up, got dressed, and got here. And if you, if you remember with me, perhaps, you think of that time, or if you raised kids, you remember there was actually a time you used to have to tell your kids to get dressed, especially on maybe a Saturday or something like that. You'd have to say, come on, get up, get dressed, let's get going. Get, I've told our kids a lot of times over the years, and I really believe this, that the battle's won in the morning and uh, uh, get ready for the day, get a good start on the day, and everything like that. My dad, being an old uh, military guy, he used to wake us up sometimes early Saturday mornings, and he would do it with uh, a revelry out of his mouth, you know. <laughs> and that's how we used to get out of bed early and get busy on chores and everything like that. It's interesting, a social media thing where you correspond with people in business, it's called LinkedIn. And in LinkedIn, there is uh, this guy who put out and wanted other people to respond with, well, what's your, your morning routine? Comment your favorite morning routine. And so a lot of people really kind of took to this and made fun of his morning routine because it was, seemed kind of precise and maybe a little over the top. And, and uh, so he's got wake up, get dressed, go to the gym, walk home from the gym. Then he says, take a very hot shower and switch to the coldest temperature halfway through for 30 seconds. Now, does that mean he took a one-minute shower? Because half of it, and I'm, you're looking at it, and you're kind of going, but he's, he's got allotted 20 minutes there. And uh, there's some things that are obvious that he doesn't seem to have allotted that probably had to go on. Uh, I like at 745, he rotates between headspace for meditation or commit to language learning on Duolingo. And that seems kind of funny. And then, you know, what is meditation for headspace? Uh, uh, but then again, I don't even know what he does. He's building neural network ML to uncomplicate HR, which I assume is human resources. But then he heads to the office and he starts accomplishing his daily goals. Now, as Christians in the morning, and I titled this message, Take Heed. One of the things I think that even as we read the Psalms that we understand is important is in the morning to have a prayer time, to have a devotional time, to start our day that way. And I see what that guy Mark Sloan's morning looked like. I can, know, I can tell you what my morning looked like before I got saved. It was woke up, fell out of bed, dragged a comb across my head, uh, found my way downstairs, drank a cup. Looking up, I noticed I was late. I drove to work, uh, found my coat, grabbed my hat, and then I drove to work way too fast. There was a band called The Beatles. Anyways. <laughs> but, you know, it, was, it didn't involve anything spiritual. And the reality of needing to start our day with prayer is so imperative. You know, some of the things we learned as a discipline now are quite refreshing, aren't they? Did you ever have to get told, brush your teeth, Did you brush your teeth, brush your teeth in the morning? Now it's like one of the first things in our routine. It's like you want it, it refreshes us, it, it feels good, it's, it's right, it's part of who we are. Some of us like to have our beds made right away so that by the time we go back in, well, you... You know, your, your bed's made and you see it made there. You're not uh, tempted to get back in and it's already messy, you know. Um, I, part of my routine for the last probably almost decade is contact lenses. I wear contact lenses. I wear this one for distance and this one for reading and up close. Now, I've had days that I've forgotten this. And sometimes it doesn't become apparent to me until I go and get out of the driveway and there's distance away and I can see things don't look like they should. And I don't even notice it a couple of times over the years until that point. And I've made decisions at that point. Sometimes I turn around and go home. Sometimes I, I get on the phone if I know Lisa or Caleb or somebody's going to be like downtown because we live on opposite ends. They're very around the church. I'll say, hey, could you bring me the contact lenses? And then there's times where I've 
went through the whole day fuzzy. <laughs> I've just decided I'm just going to go, go fuzzy today. I just, and that's kind of what I think we do without prayer starting our day. We're going fuzzy throughout the day. We're not seeing things clearly or as we ought to or anything else. We're just kind of going fuzzy. And so <clears throat> the morning routine, the Lord wants to meet us there in the morning. I know some people, they... Uh, have another morning routine that looks a little like that. They just don't care to get up and get moving, but there is a, a heavenward habit we are to have that comes about as us being Christians, and that is one of prayer. It says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in Acts 2.42, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Acts 6.4, We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So the Word and prayer are part of that. So you notice here where it says in verse 2, as Paul has moved on to practical living, and it says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And so as Paul has just gotten talking about relationships and everything else, he says one of the things that's important is that we talk to God before we talk to man and how important it is to have our relationships founded in uh, and bathed in prayer first. To give our first fruits, it talks in the scripture about giving our first fruits to the Lord. We're giving the first fruits of the, the, the day to the Lord to get a good head start on it. This two words that are given to us here in this second verse of chapter 4 of Colossians. One of them is earnestly in prayer, continuing earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So you have those words there of earnestly. It's an adverb. It's describing action. And it's, it's with sincere and intense conviction. <laughs> Seriously, intently. And then you have this other noun here that speaks of being Vigilant. In the Greek, it literally means to be wakeful, to keep a watch out for possible danger or difficulties, to be observant, attentive, and alert, on your toes. That's the kind of prayer that, that should happen. And too often, I think we, there can be a tendency just to wait till the end of the day, and then just what little bit you got left, and then the prayer is far from being attentive and alert. Or as it's been said, that we sometimes might struggle with the tiredness of the body and we keep our, to keep ourselves awake when we pray, but other times we pray as if we were asleep, Barclay said, and our prayers simply sound and feel tired and sleepy. So to be vigilant, to be wakeful, to be weary, wary, not weary. And we know we've been guilty we know the apostles were guilty, right? Going, can you pray for me? This is the Garden of Gethsemane time. Can you pray for me, guys? Just I'm going to go here a little farther. I'm going to pray. Can you guys pray? And he comes back and he went, finds him sleeping. Comes back again, finds him sleeping again. And he's like, wake up, Peter, for Pete's sake. That's actually how it started if you research the Greek. For Pete's, Pete's sake. That's it. Says, Come on. What are you doing? You're... You're, you're sleeping. Oh, can you just wait with me one hour? Be careful because when you're, when you're sleeping in prayer, what happens? You get led in, and taken away by temptation. And he doesn't want that for us. So prayer, being vigilant in it, being wakeful in it, being earnest in it with all of our hearts. The, we went to when Aria was in the hospital for two and a half months when she was first born. And we were all the family was meeting down there for Thanksgiving. And we took that day, part of uh, the next day or the day after that, and we went over to the <coughs> zoo that's in Phoenix, northwest Phoenix, off the 303, the Safari Zoo or whatever it's called. There was a group on, and so we went. And that zoo was like, it was janky. It was, just was. It was like this kind of low budge in a lot of areas so one of the first things we noticed we're going to the primate section and there's a monkey that's out of its cage went, oh, you know what a unique phenomenon to see a monkey out of its cage wonder how it got out this and that and so i go to tell one of the zookeepers you know that the monkey's out of its cage i couldn't find anybody um so as shortly thereafter i want to keep one eye on the monkey while you're looking for somebody i call him up i'm calling the zoo on my cell phone i'm calling him to get a hold of somebody and i tell him you know your monkey's out and they're like, oh, really? Where are you at? And describe the location, which one, what's it look like? Well, the small one, this now. Oh, yeah, he gets out all the time. 
uh, don't go near him, nothing like that, and everything else. And, you know, you want to interact with the monkey. when you. Had it. We were already doing stuff I guess we weren't supposed to, trying to get the monkey to come and whatever else. And, uh, and then we go over to one of their shows. And in their show, you know, you, you know one of those, they spring the wildlife out to you and everything else. And the, they, uh, there's hardly anybody that was our family and like another family that showed up right when it started. And they must not have been stoked at all about the attendance that day. And they come out, and they just, like, bring out their animals. It's like three animals. It's like a, a parrot that I know people that have better parrots than that parrot that are more exotic. And uh, it was a snake, and Jason Dean has better snakes any day than this snake was and more unique. And then there was, uh, uh, I think it was like a rabbit. I'm going, this is the show, and it was real short compared to what the program said it was going to be on the time. And so then we're going over to one of the last places, and you go into this other section, and there's a guy there with a desk and everything else, as uh, you kind of enter into that section, and he's supposed to kind of watch over that. Uh, and I think it was where the, you can go up and the giraffes are and everything. And uh, guess what that dude was doing? He was in the desk. He was, had his head down on the desk, and he was sleeping. This was even better than all the monkey video we took, because we took pictures of this guy, too. Like, you've got to be kidding me. He was being the exact opposite of what he was supposed to be, right? A sentry, a, a vigilant. He was supposed to be awake and aware and looking what's going on. And, oh, that's a perfect way that we ought to be in our prayers. And we cautioned and exhorted not to be sleepy in our prayers. And one other thing about the, the prayer that we have here is the end of verse 2. It says, with thanksgiving. And I put for the point, let's purposely put praise in our prayer. That when we're praying and we're interceding and we're asking and everything else and we're, we're making supplication, that we also have in there prayer. Isaiah tells us in the 61st uh, verse, and the uh, 61st chapter and 10th verse, as soon as I find it here, it says that I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. We have so much to be thankful for. That we have a God who beckons us to talk to him. We have a God who we have access to, according to Romans 5, according to Hebrews, that we can go boldly to the throne of grace. We obtain help in a time of need. We have a God that, that listens to us, that acts upon us, Prayer that changes our heart through prayer, everything else. And the enemy comes in, and what he wants to do is, is sometimes just rob our joy. And the joy of the Lord, it tells us in Nehemiah, is our strength. And we ought to consciously just make an effort to remember all that we have to be thankful for when we're talking to our God. He, he gives us peace. He gives us protection. He is our high priest. We need to remember who we're talking to, all that he is. He's our redeemer, our rescuer, our refuge. He's the captain of the Lord's army. He is El Roy, the God who sees me. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is Jehovah Nisi, our, uh, our banner. He is, he is um, Jehovah Rapha, our shepherd. He, he's our, our healer. He's all those things. He's Jehovah Sictanu, our righteousness. That's who we're talking to. That's who we can rejoice that, that he hears us. He acts. He has our eternal best in mind. And he's going to work those things out. And so he says prayer with thanksgiving. And then he goes, since he's talking about prayer here, and he's put as a central point in need in the Christian's life for, for victory and maturity, he says in verse 3, Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. He's going to mention the fact that he's, this is one of the prison epistles, that he's in chains in the last verse as well, but he says, though I'm in chains, and he said, pray that the door might be open. He's open because he's shared the gospel. I mean, he's in prison because God opened the door that he could share the gospel. And the, and the Lord never told us it would be easy, did he? It says in Matthew, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless and do as doves. But his prayer here, when he says, meanwhile, pray for us. And I'm thankful for people to pray, for the leadership here, for others here, for myself and our family here. I, I'm thankful for prayer. It lifts pe people up. God does stuff through prayer that gets accomplished 
no other way. So he says, pray for us too. And I put, for heaven's sake. See, it's not all about the material, the physical, the tangible, the touchable at all. He has a heavenly mindset. He's talking about the gospel going forth. He's talking about God getting the glory for the sacrifice of his son. He says, the doors will be open that people might hear, that we might proclaim the truth. And as he says those things there, I put, for heaven's sake, that's the things he has on his mind. He says in 2 Corinthians 2.12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel, a door was opened to me, by the Lord. In Ephesians, it says, in 6, 19 and 20, that I, Paul pr- asked that they would um, pray for him, that he would proclaim the mystery of the gospel, even though he was an ambassador in chains, that I might declare it boldly and speak as I ought to speak. It says in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, that a great and effective door has been opened, and he says, but there are many adversaries. Like I said, it didn't say it would be easy. It would be sheep among wolves sometimes. Everything else, Acts 4, 20, 1427, they gathered together and they were all rejoicing, reporting how the Lord had opened doors for them for the gospel. And so even the door that was open in prison where the rotating guards in the praetorium were given the gospel and there was many in Caesar's household, we know that came to faith. You have um, this priority of giving out the gospel and the message and the word that he says, I pray that the doors get open, and would you pray for me? And when we see all those times, four different ones that I listed off, that that prayer was answered, and the gospel went out, and it went forth. Specific prayer and specific answer to that prayer. And we ought to care about what God cares about, and that's getting the gospel out. And So he says, that I make manifest as I ought to speak in verse 4. And then he says... Verse 5, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Paying attention to the fact that time is this wonderful resource we are given, that we are called to be responsible for and stewards over, that we only have so much time. Lord, put it on my heart kind of heavy just a couple of days ago, praying with our youngest, Caleb. We have down to 16-year-old, up to 32-year-old, Nicole, and all those in between the five of them, but with Caleb, our last one at home, it just was on my heart as I was praying with him. You know, Father, thank you for your grace and everything else, but Lord, as I look back on my life, and I've got more time behind me than than in front of me, um, thank you for helping me make the most and consider and number my days, the the rest of uh, whatever time you want to give me, that I'm able to be, you know, effective and in the ministry and and living a life that gives you glory and everything. I said, but for Caleb, who's got so much, should you tarry in front of him and not so much behind him at 16 years old? Oh, God, give him wisdom to start walking earlier in a way that uh, will be a blessing to him because he's glorifying you through his life. And so heavenly thoughts and priorities are there. And it says there to walk in wisdom about these things to those who are outside, those who don't know the Lord and redeem the time. And so in dealing with people that don't know the Lord and as it's been said, being the only Bible they might read, um, let your speech, verse 6, always be with grace. It always ought to have that heart of grace behind it. But it also ought to be seasoned with salt that you might know how to answer each one. Now, Norman Geisler I don't know if you, you know who he is, but if more people probably know today who Ravi Zacharias is. Ravi Zacharias is one of my greatest influences is Norman Geisler. Norman Geisler has authored or edited and been a part of like 90 books. He's got several degrees, started two uh, theological schools. He's just an amazing guy. He's 85 now in the winter of his life. And I love still to, to listen to him sometimes and watch a video or something. But he came to... Uh, uh, with this, all of his uh, learning and all of the information that goes through him all came from him getting stumped a few times as a young Christian wanting to share the truth about who God is and running into people, a lot of people who are atheists. Um, he gives out these statistics that, you know, many Buddhists are atheists. They'll say, well, I don't believe in any God. That's part of the Buddhist religion. You get born again. I mean, you get uh, reincarnated and everything. Uh, most secular humanists are atheists. All Marxists are atheists. 5% of all Americans are atheists. I got to share with a full-on atheist just in in my uh, 
in some personal time just less than a week ago, or about a, a week and a day ago. And there are still a lot, 5% are atheists that you run into. But 30% of the English, England and stuff, that area, UK, are atheists. 60% of Swedes are atheists. 80% of those in Russia are atheists. And so unless you want a ministry to atheists, don't move far east. Because it seems like there's a pattern there right now in the society today. But he wanted to grow in being able to give an answer for the hope that lied within him. With meekness and gentleness. And he, he's just a wonderful uh, man of God. that You can read a lot of stuff about. And so, but he wanted to be an apologist. To be able to answer these questions. We ought to want, want to know them. And answer them. We ought to know these things. But we also ought to know it and we ought to show it. The wisdom that is from above, it's pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's willing to yield, it's full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. The world knows how a Christian ought to act and how a Christian ought to love. And it says there with grace is how it ought to be. With understanding when you speak with an individual, understanding that individual. Not with a, a, a speech that you've prepared that goes out to everyone about the truth of God, but something that um, relates to that person and has compassion for that person has grace for that person it's what we ought to show we, ought to, we, ought, we don't have to worry about winning the argument, God's won amen, every knee is going to bow every tongue is going to confess, God's won it's not that that's the, the concern it's not winning the argument, it's caring for the person, caring for their soul and having a conversation that is suited for each person, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, it's been said in, in Christians, we ought to have graciousness and sensitivity in our correspondence with people. And it ought to be seasoned with salt here, it tells us. Salt had a lot of things it would have understood in that day. One of them is it stopped decay, right? It stopped rot. And so with the morals of our country today, the Christians, by the Holy Spirit, are called to kind of curb that, I know, and to stop that uh, moral decay that's going on as a preservative in the decay, but also to cleanse as an antiseptic. Nothing better... I've found to help me when my throat starts to get sore than to gargle with simple salt water. And so it's an antiseptic. But also what else is salt? It's flavor. I like a little salt on something. It tastes really bland if you don't have any salt at all sometimes. Salt was a precious commodity way back when. Now there's mountains of it. It's no big thing. But to have salt is a, a good flavor. Now, spiritually speaking, we've tasted of the Lord, haven't we, Christians? And we say He's good. Amen? Shouldn't there be something like, not like we just ate something sour. Well, oh, I'm a Christian now, so I don't get to tell people off like I used to. It's kind of a bummer to be a Christian. I can't, I can't get mad in traffic like I used to because uh, it just kind of soured me. You know, I can't listen to this anymore. I can't do that anymore. I can't watch the other thing. I can't act like... No, it's, I've tasted of the Lord. I know he's good. I've I got a, uh, something that's running around inside of us that is tasty, that is delicious, that is enjoyable. And so that's kind of the picture we have here. And so he goes on here, and he says now he's going to name off a bunch of people that helped him give out the gospel. Tychicus is the first one in verse 7. A beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. He'll tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. He wanted the, those people in Colossae to be ministered to, but he also wanted to hear about how it was going with them, and he also knew they had a relationship, and they'd want to hear about how things were going uh, with him as well. And so it's, it's important. The messenger is also, the message and the messenger matter. We're not just these vehicles to get out information. God cares about us as his messengers. And so we see all these guys and people that are mentioned here, but we also see that um, there's a great care it says in verse 9, With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, he will make known to you all the things that are happening here. Onesimus, if you read the book of Philemon, we know that he was a runaway slave. And I like what it says about Onesimus. It doesn't say, you know that guy who ran away some of his past, he was a slave. And No, he says he's a faithful and beloved brother. He's one of you. He's in the family. He's just like you. Uh, the Lord brings people up 
from what they previously were. In Revelation 2.17, it says, I will give them a stone, a white stone, and on the stone a new name written that no one knows except him who receives it. It has a new name for each one of us. It's better than the name we got. It says in Isaiah that it's better than that of sons or, or daughters it's, it can have, and it's an eternal name. So what a great thing that is to consider how God lifts us up. And you see Onesimus is the guy he cared about and was lifted up uh, even here in the scripture. Another thing, he says, I want to send them to you and I want to hear personally. And there is nothing like old school FaceTime. I don't know if you um, do FaceTime or Skype or whatever with grandkids in different states now uh, from the moves that have happened in the last year and a half. We uh, are grateful for FaceTime and being able to see our kids and our grandkids. But why in the world, if it was as sufficient as being there face to face, would I jump into a metal tube and go through TSA and go 650 miles an hour across the sky, right? We want to see them face to face. There's something about face to face that is the best. And in this world of texting and emails and everything else, you know, there can be a lot lost in the translation. And when you can be there face to face, it's just the best thing. Even as John said in Second John, he said, I have many things to write to you. I do not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Old school FaceTime, where you actually were there face to face. So it goes on in verse 10, and it names some of his Jewish friends. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, so a guy had the same name, was a popular name, when Jesus was uh, alive and born and everything like that. And he apparently says, you know what, I don't want the same name as my Lord, so I'll be referred to as Justice. I mean, if you were named Jesus, you might want to change it. If you were uh, an American in the English uh, speaking Jesus. So these are my, my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. See, they were Jewish, for they proved to be a comfort to me, the Jews that were working with him. And one of the things I think is neat there, of course, when you see Mark, that's John Mark, that's Barnabas' nephew, and that's when they had a big clash, and, and Paul said, I'm not going to do any more ministry with this guy. But in the end of it all, there was reconciliation, like in the end of Philemon, it says, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. And, and uh, Timothy, will see the, the scripture in a minute where he says, hey, send Mark. He's been a benefit to me. So there's regard. He regards him now because there's been reconciliation. And that's neat. That's the thing that happens in the Lord, that he's the God of reconciliation. And so we should try to reconcile with one another when we have issues and God can work these things out. So it goes on and it says in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those who are in Eropolis. So you can always spot them, you know that? People that pray for you, people that are praying for others. And what, what does it translate? They got a zeal for people. They got a zeal for the gospel. And he says, this guy, um, has a, Epaphras, has a zeal, and I know he's fervently been praying for you. And fervent prayer for people will also help you grow in a, in a zeal for them. And so and then he says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet all the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphias and the church that is in his house. Now you'll notice there, there might be a little uh, A or something like that, or the, his might be italicized, and they see some text. Um, translated as a her. We don't know if Nymphias was a him or a her. We know that that person had a church in their house. We know that when we get to heaven, we'll figure it out. Um, but that's why it's uh, like that in many of your Bibles. So I put, you know, it takes all kinds. To give out the gospel, people need to work together. We need to collaborate. We need to cooperate. And we need to care for each other and act like a family, act like there's something greater than ourselves that we're, we're proclaiming. And I'm so glad when that happens in so many different ways as I've been in the body of Christ for decades now. Um, it takes all kinds of people. And there's a sad side note that we don't see here. And one of them is Demas. 
See, Demas, it says later, he left us having loved, or literally he was in love with the present world. He fell in love with the world over the church. And it's going to cause separation sometimes. When somebody wants to walk back out into the world, they don't want their Christian friends hanging out with them a whole lot. It, it, it ruins their buzz, you know? And so they, want to, they don't want to hear their backsliding. You don't even have to tell them they're convicted by your life a lot of times. And so that's one of the... It, but be thankful for the time God had them with you and care for them and pray for them. If you know people that are backslidden or you have someone in your, on your heart, um, and thank God that he put them in there to serve some ministry purpose for the time but that he would um, or she would come back to know the Lord should be the prayer, and you should love him. It takes all kinds. And people come and people go, and God has a right to send people and move people and everything else that he, he wants to do. Even as at the end of Paul's life, he said, you know, uh, can you get Mark? There's only Luke with me right now. And he, he goes on in those verses, says, I sent so-and-so, you know, Timothy here, Tychicus there, and stuff like that. And the only thing I know in ministry for, for me is the one that God has called till death do us part. There's only one, and that's Lisa. And so I, I know that even as the psalmist said, though your father and your mother, they, they leave you, they forsake you, they could have died or whatever, because the Lord will stand by me. And so always have that in, as you go through your walk in your life that things change in relationships and people. Um, it's great if you're blessed with a, a marriage like We've been blessed with, not everyone is blessed like that. It's been great for the last third of a century, a little plus, more than that. But um, you never know who's going to be there. You've got to know what God's called you to, and you've got to keep moving forward with that. You, you know, one person said, Jeff Brandt, uh, a couple decades ago, when first, you know, realizing God, had, there's a call to, to minister in Havasu, and he said, I'll be with you till the wheels come off. And I thought, what a great statement, what a great guy to say that and everything else. Unfortunately, there is photographic evidence that wheels have actually came off in our relationship. And so for that reason, I say, well, he's, he stuck it out as long as he said. Um, there's a past there, but uh, that's funny stuff, huh, Carissa? And I make sure you share it with Jeff later, who has to, they change his schedule so he's not here, he's working here. He'd be a, he's a third service guy uh, lately. So... Now, verse 16, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of Laodiceans, and uh, that you like, uh, uh, likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So it seems like maybe there was another epistle that we didn't, that we don't have um, that was specific to Laodicea. And this, say to Archippus, take heed to your ministry. That's where I got the title from. Take it seriously, what you've been given which you have received from the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Finish your walk. And I want to stir and not stagnate. And when you get walking with the Lord for years, sometimes you can start to stagnate in your walk and get comfortable and just go, I'm going to heaven and I'll just be glad when I get there. No, it says in 2 Timothy, it says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands when he anointed him. But every single one of you have been given a gift that's a Christian. You've been given a gift of time. You've been given a gift of the word. You've been given a, a gifts. So be stirred today to serve the Lord. If you've been given something. Take heed with your life to be a, a minister. It says that every member is a minister in the scripture. So we tend to think of certain people and jobs as being ministers. No, every Christian. And then he goes on, verse 18, and he says, This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. And I love the fact that he ends with that word, which he starts so many of them, grace and peace, but he ends with, with grace. Grace. We can be blessed even in the midst of a mess. Acts 14.22 says, They strengthen the souls, the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Now, that verse, I like to be strengthened. Anybody like to be strengthened? I like to be exhorted. That means to kind of coach and push and to move forward in my walk. And I want to continue in the faith. And then this one part, though, many tribulations. I don't, I'm not real keen on that. 
But it's the reality of life, whether you're a believer or not. There's many tribulations sometimes. And I like what it says, though, around that that's pretty cool. It's through. We're going to get through. God's going to take us through. And then what do we do? We enter in the kingdom. So it's, it's, it's through many. We, we enter in. And God uses these things to be a blessing. Even these messes that we wouldn't think ever could be. Didn't uh, Jacob make a mess sometimes? But he awoke and he said from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. I didn't even know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And there's sometimes the mess. We might not see it. But I'm telling you what, there is a great hope that we have that we will see come to full fruition. We don't like it sometimes now, but, um, and we can sing easier than we can do sometimes. So blessed, you know, be your name when the land of plentiful and the streams of abundance flow. But uh, how about when we're in the desert place and we're in the wilderness? But it says still we should say, we praise your name. The sacrifice of praise of our lips, it says in Hebrews 13. So there is that, um, that blessing that comes later so often. How about Job? Didn't he have a blessing that God intended in the end? But he had to go through it first before he got the blessing that God intended in the end. How, how about Joseph? Is there a guy who went through some stuff, but God knew how to turn what was evil for good, though there was a mess in it? And there are some that I, so many in the fellowship through the years that I've, I've been alongside and seen their pain and their grief and their hurt that have buried their kids, some of them, that have buried their spouses, that have buried their businesses, that have buried their, their dreams and their aspirations, that have buried things dear to them. They've buried relationships because sometimes Jesus comes to bring a sword and you get saved and you want to follow it. Some people that... You had a relationship, don't want anything to do with you. And they've buried those things. And yet, there's a resurrection that's coming. And without the burial and the death, you can't have the resurrection. And some of those that we love the most that we read, many of us, like Charles Spurgeon or C.S. Lewis, the pain that they went through and the things they endured, or Elizabeth Elliot or Nick Voyage, um, Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata, Amy Carmichael said this, No wound, no scar, yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole, can thou have followed far, who hast no wound or hast no scar. A.W. Tozer said that I doubt if somebody could be used greatly that God hasn't allowed to be wounded deeply. And I've seen that to show up so many times in... Uh, in life. But even as we look at the heartache and the hardships that are going on right now in, uh, in Texas from Hurricane Harvey, and I, I put in social media and on your bulletins, if you want to give, don't give through here. There's no need for, for that. Uh, just keep it real clean. But there are so many people that uh, I got at one list from from Santa for Arizona Policy of 42 ministries that are collecting that they take, uh, they would recommend. I, I have two that are on there. It's Calvary Chapel of the Woodlands that I'm on the board of, and I, I know Bruce well, and he's out there uh, just working hard, and they're, now they're gutting out houses and everything else. And when I first heard it, I said, I wish I was in a physical condition and it was closer because I'd take the sea dues out when the rescue portion, right, in a few days and just see if there's anybody because it's like a flat bottom boat. You could, you could go on that. But uh, I know that the scripture says that it's better a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. And the fact is there was only opportunity for those geographically so close that could get there within hours. To, and all the people who were rescued, though, I know uh, over 30 perished. I, I know that the, there's a neat thing in humanity kind of where people are just coming to the fore. Uh, Michael Dell from Dell Computers and his wife Susan pledged $36 million, already given half of that. Um, different businesses in Texas, $72 million, already given. Uh, Donald, President Donald Trump said, I'll give a million. I don't know if it's a foundation or it's personal. People are fighting over that or whatever. Um, but J.J. Watts, the football player for the Houston 
Texans. He wanted to do a fundraiser. He said, hope to get a you know, quarter of a million or something like that. It's over 12 million right now that's going to help people. But the other place that I talk about besides Calvary Woodlands is Calvary uh, of Houston. Ron Hint, good friend. And he, um, th they're doing 100%, whatever goes in. And I like that because a lot of places pop up and they take administration fees out of it. And 100% is going to relief. Right now they are feeding 4,000 people a day there. And as the word spreads, they expect it. They're anticipating 10,000 a day that they'll be feeding there at, out of Calvary Chapel, Houston. And as you look at that, you know what? There wasn't 4,000 and there sure wasn't 10,000 coming there to hear the word of God, to see the love of God exhibited and to, to be fed not only physically but to be fed spiritually. It's a mess. But there's ministry in the midst of it. And there's a message in the midst of it. And there's goodness in the midst of that. And so as we come to the table right now, the Lord's table, what a mess. What a mockery of a trial that happened with Jesus. What a, what a mess of a friendship that Judas did when, when he betrayed him. What a mess, a bloody mess on the cross. But he brings beauty from ashes, doesn't he? And this thing that we are told to remember, what a mess. But right in the midst of it, we have our Lord Jesus, even as he closed sh sh here, showing grace. The grace that said, you know what, that prodigal, he doesn't need a lecture right now. He needs a, he needs a, a hug. He, he needs a ring on his finger. He needs a party to be thrown. That's what he needs. And, that's what, and even the brother who was a Pharisee, you know, you see the prodigal, uh, you see the father going after that prodigal and going out and saying, hey, your brother who was dead is now alive and come on in and don't miss the party. And so let's go to prayer and then we'll go to the table. Father, we thank you that you are the one who brings beauty from ashes. And that there can be blessing even in the middle of turmoil and trials. And that you can draw us closer, Lord, in ways we never thought possible. And Lord, there is experiences in our relationship that we can have when uh, there's hardship and heartache that the Lord would have never came about in any other way. And so, Lord, cause us to trust. It still takes faith to walk with you. Let us not just look at the, be short-sighted, forgetting all that you've given us and all that you are and all that you've forgiven us. And Lord, so I pray just draw each person close as the elements are passed in the song is saying, and I pray if there's any here that haven't surrendered their life to you, that they would just confess to you their great need for you, repent, turn from self and sin, and trust in you and cling to you. And all this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.